Okay, everyone is uh, hearing correctly. The sound is enough. You could be maybe further away. <laughs> it's the exact wall over there. So it's a good question of limit. You touch them. Because the question here is about a few of our acceptations. Acceptations of limit, acceptation of uh, what can be changed inside the uh, options we have, and especially in terms of uh, sanitary uh, impact, in terms of uh, health impact, and in terms of what global health represents. Global health has been uh, in the air for a while, but uh, last uh, spring, so it's very recent, it has been uh, taken the shapes uh, of a new group, a working group inside uh, WHO, the World Health Organization, uh, by getting to a few principles and uh, getting the uh, question from three major uh, organizations under the UN uh, uh, umbrella. So the first is the WHO, the second is the OIE, former Observatoire International des Episodi, so meaning the uh, animal diseases. Uh, and the uh, third is the Food and Agriculture Organization, the FAO. And uh, the principle for that were to get the largest perspective uh, to prevent the new crisis. Uh, obviously, this has been introduced uh, during the COVID-19 uh, pandemics. And the idea there was uh, to be able to better respond at what was going on at the animal human interface. There were four working group inside this. And surveillance and data sharing were one of the most important, especially getting the understanding of what the drivers of spillover, meaning getting from one species to another in both ways, from animals to human, but also from human to animals. Uh, and this is typically what the case is now with deers, with um, uh, lots of animals that get secondary infection from uh, the human COVID epidemic. So the question is how you uh, understand all this. And what is intriguing is that they spend probably a few hours at the beginning of uh, the joint session just to make the point of what do we do? Do we go for an anthropocentered version of it? Or do we go for the full landscape? And in fact, this first one was probably taken, not completely right away, but it means, again, that this is always a question. And obviously, they are not paid for anything else rather than prevent our problems. Question is, can we get the full picture inside of our understanding with all the interacting factors that get from all these elements? And. Uh, from those dynamics, it's also a question of uh, what was the um, major uh, factor to uh, get that um, action. Is that a new process or a continuous one? And if you look at what were the arguments for that, uh, under stress with declining support from donors, uh, we stand at a crossroad. All the words were like, uh, we need to uh, make new alignments of, uh, not planets, but uh, countries and decision makers to achieve these global goals in global health, uh, with major concern how to ensure the long-term sustainability of that. So you would say, well, that's the right perspective for uh, 21, 2021. In fact, this was the letter of dismissal from Michel Kazachkin, who was the head of the Global Fund for AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria uh, 10 years ago. 10 years ago, crisis. Again, crisis. So how do we get into the understanding of things are going on, things are progressing, things are regressing? How do we get the larger uh, perspective on that? And especially, how do we properly analyze the factors, understand the interaction, between factors and eventually act and anticipate and prevent the uh, consequences of all of those. If we take the climate change as an example for that, uh, 
you need to understand what are the nonlinear processes between the factors. Meaning by that, it's not while we are getting an increase in factor that the other would increase at the same rate. A lot of those interactions are exponential, logarithmic, uh, are complex, and all the systems when there are three, four, five factors, especially when you have multiple ones, goes with very specific pathways, and we have to understand which is the one we are included in. We have to understand what is the context, context of vulnerabilities. We have to see if there are limits, human limits, planetary limits, growth limits. And especially also when we can understand that, try to act, for example, for the climate change, the principal action that has been set for uh, more than uh, 20 years and written in the previous uh, report of the IPCC uh, was not to use 80% of what remains inside the uh, Earth crust in terms of fossil resources. So fossil energy, we have to abandon them. We have to give that away. We know that for uh, decades. Do we do it? We don't. We need warmth inside our buildings, we need cloth, we need uh, transport, transport systems to bring food on our tables and in our mouth. We need uh, what is now on 80% of the energy production due to fossil energies. So we understand, we have to maintain the long-term goals, we still don't act. We have to put the climate into all public health policies, but also else into all the global policies, uh, and especially sometimes try to develop some co-benefit situation. One very simple example of that is, for example, what we call active mobilities. Active mobility is just walking or biking into cities. You earn on the else, the individual else, because you are getting exercise instead of being sedentary. You get environmental uh, benefit because you are not producing CO2. Uh, and uh, you are now in a way that you may understand a few things that are not on what was in the agenda 20 years ago, for example, when you were planning uh, urban development. The WHO has summarized that, saying that the health of the population were depending on the functional stability of ecosystems and of the biospheric, uh, biospheric systems that were essential to life. But what is essential? In fact, soils are water, and water sharing will be energy, we say it, climate, nutrition, biodiversity, many of those are included in the agenda, makes a large window. And in the Lancet, uh, they were planning a few of the impact that we could have, showing that this would be the most important health threat in the 21st century, adding 250,000 deaths possibly every year uh, at the middle of this uh, uh, next decade. But they assume, and this is why it is underlined, they assume, they assume a continuous progress in economic growth and health protection, because both of them are closely linked. We will see that. And the question is, uh, can we make that hypothesis for a long period? In fact, those are uh, inside the Sustainable Development Goals, wrote, written by uh, UN, and uh, that many countries were agreeing on uh, a few years ago. But the climate action, the number 13, beside all the other, also depend on the eighth one. Decent work and economic growth. Are those compatible? Because when you, we look now at what the waves are, and you have heard of many waves in the last month, uh, the sanitary one is perhaps, consciously or not, the one that uh, people, states, governments are providing as the major um, cloud, would say, 
not to look at the next ones. That would be an energy <coughs> crisis, directly linked to the economy, a climate one, do we have the way to solve that, and the biodiversity, which would be probably the most important. Because uh, just as an example, recently published just uh, three weeks ago, when you look at what was the marine uh, resources, fishes, in the seas and oceans before the uh, industry period, and when you look at what is now present in all the oceans and seas, you see those major reduction in fish catches, but also in the fish and marine metabolism inside those areas. And you see, for example, in Australia, how red is the part around the major coral reef. These hotspots are uh, major problems, not only for the fish industry, but as a sign of the global dysregulation of what would be. So the question is, on the red list, are we there? Are we now inside the trap, or can we escape it? So to answer one of those questions, we have to look at what is the context. The context is on the limits, something which was very funny, uh, very uh, intriguing, getting out of the sports science, looking at uh, what we were going after uh, a century, more of a century of uh, continuous progression. Continuous, yes, but not linear progression. And it seemed that we are now reaching a few asymptotes, uh, and there are just a few millimeters to get for certain events. You have still a few world records sometimes. You have technology getting inside the pools, for example, 10 years ago with the swimming uh, suits uh, that helped a major increase by 3%. But after they took those swimsuits off, they went back by the same amount. Uh, you can see the shoes now that help to maybe bring the record of the uh, marathon uh, under the two hours. Not yet in race, but it has been done on a specific event just uh, organized for that. But you need the shoes to do it. You need the technology to bring back more energy from your steps and then getting at a higher speed. There is no other way. Technology has its own advantages and its own problems. But when you look at what, what the economic expansion uh, for France, for example, you see the exact same. With the two major events outside of the sport or outside of the economic uh, condition that were the two world wars during the 18th in a, in a 20th century, excuse me. When you look at these gross rates of the gross national products and what we call the CSBM in, in French, when you consume the care uh, and the medical um, uh, care, you see that this expansion rate went down. And in fact, we were nulling it in this decade. Remember the minus eight in the previous year during the COVID. And in fact, for the physiology, for life expectancy, for agriculture yields, for Height, the height, the mean height of the population in 180 countries over the world, in economy, in energy consumption per capita, we are still seeing those events one after one. So, in fact, was, uh, what we see here that this gross optimization has been up, but 10 toward uh, an asymptote for the food energy uh, that has been doubled. For example, we went from uh, uh, 1,700 up to 3,500 calories per day per capita in the developed countries only. At the same time, we increased performance, we increased height, we increased weight by much more than height. Uh, age at the first birth went up, uh, life expectancy, uh, both in developed and in emerging countries. Uh, economy, knowledge, unmeasurable way of measuring knowledge, but most of it increased. The question is, did that always happen with the same uh, shape? 
And in fact, the second is if we arrive at those ceilings, at those maxima, uh, is there a true biological one uh, limit for that? This is a question that is addressed in one exhibition, which is right now at the Musée de l'Homme uh, in Paris, uh, which would provide a few keys uh, to get that in a little bit uh, more uh, detailed way. But the reduced margin of adaptation for that, for example, is also one of these parameters that the COVID-19 were hitting in front of it. Uh, the relation that you have with the COVID mortality and the age of the population, the aging population, with the proportion of population above 80, for example, just bring you all over the world a direct connection with that. And not only with the age of the population, but with the progression of life expectancy in the last decades. And when you look at that, it means that when you are at the upper left side of it, for uh, USA, UK, France, Sweden. These are the countries where the life expectancy is the most elevated, but also where the progression is the smallest in the last decade. Whereas on the right side, you have all the sub uh, Saharan, sub Saharan uh, African countries where the life expectancy still progresses at a very high pace, which was the one we had in the now developed countries called high income countries now. Uh, in uh, the 50s and 60s, what we call in French les 30 glorieuses, the glorious 30, uh, 30 years from 50 to 80, uh, when this was um, happening at the same rate of having the uh, life expectancy getting up by 12 months every year, almost. So it means that uh, the Risk factor now, through aging of a population, is also one of the factors that explain what the mortality of a pandemic, which is coming now, uh, brings uh, as an evidence. And the second point is, if we are ending at those ceilings and we have rising constraints, environmental constraints, and now you recognize here, obviously, one of the hockey cross curves that is going up, which is just the temperature all over the world. The results might be slightly different of what we are expecting at each electoral period. And the action obviously is not maybe to get at a higher point, but at least at minimum to reduce what would be the negative consequence of that uh, we would say in marine terms, route de collision. I don't know if the uh, English translation for that collision route is the exact way, but you understand, I think, what the image gives. Okay, this is the one, and this might be very different to what we do, because if our goal as physician, but as uh, scientist and to understand and try to provide you with a few of those cases. First, trying not to deteriorate the situation, the primum non nocere in Latin, is in fact uh, the exact contrary that we did. We need to learn how to work in degraded condition. There are two options, degraded or very degraded. We have to understand that. We have to also act very cautiously uh, when we are close to the abyss. And in fact, otherwise, if we do the opposite, we'd probably not uh, be exactly the uh, expected result that we would like. Uh, again, through and around this uh, exhibition, there one was manifesto by the Museum, uh, Museum d'Histoire Naturelle, close to it, uh, to us here, um, suggesting that we arrive at those elements and all these moments provide an idea of what uh, this long cycle of development is reaching to. So we had that book with uh, Gilles Boeuf, the head of the museum a few years ago, uh, looking at uh, the question of uh, adaptation and the margins of adaptations remaining, and also what were the vulnerability. One of these with Bernard Swingado uh, is, as I mentioned, uh, the aging. And 
very briefly to, to see how we can uh, understand those is to look at how the capacities during uh, the uh, lifespan and during time are progressing up to your maximum and you are reaching that now and when we progressively get older we lose a few of them. This curve here is everywhere in physiology, in every organ and in every species. We've done that work in mice, in horses, in dogs, in uh, very small worms, Cenorhabditis elegans. Uh, all of those always provide the same uh, way of understanding the progression. And here is just the uh, women 400 meter, so the round the stadium, just one turn of the stadium. When you look at these world record at each age, this is exactly uh, described by that very simple equation, which provide, in fact, a way of understanding the growth, and the growth rate is diminishing with time, and at the same time, something which is very related to the cost of maintenance, which are growing uh, every day, in fact and showing what the vulnerability threshold may be. You have to provide a very large prevention and a very soft environment for your kids when they are very, very young, okay, before they get to some autonomy. But at the opposite side, you have also to provide the proper environment for your parents uh, when they get older because they lose progressively those capacities. And this is obviously uh, also what you see from the progression of the uh, diseases, what we call the degenerative diseases like cardiovascular diseases, like cancer, uh, like neurovascular uh, diseases, going up exponentially. And uh, seeing that all these intrication now must be understood when you are, for example, looking not only at age, but adding, for example, the second parameter, temperature, that we talk about. And uh, when you look at the third plane, you can see that you have some optimum conditions. When it's very cold, you have a lot of problems to acclimate. Okay? When it's very hot, same way. And you have an optimum between 20 and 25 Celsius degree, when you can have most of your physiology uh, having its higher rate, but not only. The economy is also uh, and labor, for example, productivity, is also depending on curves like that. Obviously, at an older age, you have the same relation, but very much reduced. It also means that the vulnerability is now much too close, much closer when you get there and you have a small heat wave, obviously even more when it's a canicule, uh, when you lose the most vulnerable of them. But you may expand a little bit more uh, those ideas by getting what would be the ideal uh, BMI, the weight for your size. When you get very uh, heavy, uh, you will lose that. When you get too much salt, you get hypertension, you degrade your cardiovascular system, then you enter with hypertrophic uh, myocardiopathy, and uh, you reduce your heart and vascular functions. So you have an optimum, not zero, but not too much. Sugar is the same for diabetes, for example, when you get um, energy in a way. And in fact, when you understand all this, you can uh, imagine that all this is uh, described but by what we can call a Pareto front curve. And this Pareto front tells you that you cannot get an improvement somewhere without reducing a capacity somewhere else. So it's always a question of trade-off. You know about trade-off. That's your education. And we need to understand that this is the very heart of what the distribution of your energy and your capacity can do inside your own body. Uh, in complex system, it's always uh, the way that uh, things are uh, getting, and you are moving all around. Sometimes you get sick, but when you recover, you get back up to your maximal capacity. And from that, and from the understanding of that sharing uh, efficiency from function to function, 
We also understand that from the early uh, period of the Industrial Revolution, we had very low parameters, for example, for life duration. Between 30 and 35 years old was the uh, mean. Not the maximum. The maximum was above 100 years old for the, what we call the maximal longevity. But the mean for the population, what we calculate as the life expectancy, was between 30 and 35 at that time, just because of a very high mortality rate for infants, for very young kids. But what was done is a large increase of that capacity up to the uh, early 21st century. And then suddenly you understand that at the end of each of those curves, you have those elements of vulnerability because you are way out, far away from the optimum uh, intervals up there. And then you understand that it's the perfect scenario for what we can call the primary predators, bacteria, parasites, fungus, and viruses. They are always there around. Maybe a new one is changing the genetic codes. And then it enters where? Right into the vulnerability uh, window. And this is what happened uh, last year. And the question is, under those external pressure, what is the future? Where do we get? Can we still maintain our levels for a large period of time. Because all this is depending on the interactions. So the interdependencies is, for example, in those elements when you see humans surrounded by species, and especially viruses, bacteria, uh, when you target one of this, you need to understand that there will be a reaction all over, because they are in networks of interactions. And when you provide one action, you usually understand the direct, the binary relation. It's not enough. When you want to have a global view, you need to understand the networks and how from one answer you will get the global uh, answer of the system. And again, if you are looking at that Pareto front figure from above uh, and see what was going on in the 20th century, uh, you see the vulnerability all around the core and the action of what would be a few of the uh, primary predators, but also what is the decreasing capacity due to pollutant, for example, pesticide. You were just uh, addressing that issue in the previous uh, seminar. Uh, but what is coming from our own uh, developing process with a large cohort of uh, age people with metabolic environmental uh, risk factors, then the action of all those may be decoupled from uh, the uh, primary expectation we had. And then reduce again uh, what would be our surface, our uh, area of uh, capacity. So when we get that, uh, in response to what pressure and how much pressure we put onto the environment, we have to understand that this is always an action-reaction process. So there is some reaction that are coming back, and climate change is only one of them. Obviously, it is going on uh, a specific uh, way, showing that uh, this has not been reduced in the last uh, years. It is a process going on. And the n previous report this summer of the chapter one of the IPCC, and we will deliver uh, the second in, uh, and the third in uh, 2022, especially on the chapter on health, um, show that this is increasing at a pace that we have never known for a millennia. Because uh, what you see here is the last slope here, which is 10 times higher of what was the last global warming uh, before the Earth. And just between uh, 17,000 and uh, 8,000, those uh, 10,000 years uh, showed that 
the pace was slow enough, I would say, so many species could adapt to it. Now the question of adaptation is, do we have the physiological keys to make our changes? Genetic changes are taking millennia, so it means that the uh, arrow of time here is not enough to understand how genetics is providing step by step the way that we can change a little bit of one of our enzyme inside the mitochondria and uh, try to address the heat inside our bodies. But the most important is that we don't sense the gradual changes. We need tools to do that. Just a simple example, when you get from winter to summer, you get changes in the uh, Alp landscapes. But this is a century uh, changes. And uh, this was not obvious until you see the pictures one to the other. The volume that is now uh, included in is huge when you see what is going on for all um, ice uh, regions in uh, all mountains, Himalayas included. And the question is, how do we act when we don't get that sensation? We act when we have the extreme events. And this is only the key when we open the eyes. The Xintia storm uh, 10 years ago in France, one, one of them. Uh, the recent uh, inundation and uh, the precipitation we have seen this summer in uh, Germany, Belgium. Uh, the location that were uh, touched by the uh, Idai uh, hurricane in uh, March three years ago in uh, Mozambique. Uh, the probability also uh, that is obviously getting up, uh, showing that uh, it is no longer uh, rare event that even the most uh, developed countries now get. Remember New York that was uh, off light uh, for a third of, its, uh, of the Manhattan uh, area at that time. But other uh, elements show that uh, record can be taken in uh, Australia, for example. Uh, this was uh, three years ago. But uh, two years ago, you remember another of those extreme events uh, through mega fires. This one was uh, taking the toll of life of millions of uh, fishes, and especially center, um, centenarian ones, which were very specific uh, species uh, in Australia, uh, showing that these impacts, again, are uh, very much much larger than we were expecting. And getting from uh, those uh, elements, we understand that this deformation, uh, the word that has been uh, created to see how much and how fast it is going now through the IUCN uh, red list, showing that uh, those are also uh, integrated into major uh, elements, such as the mega fires. So what are the principles and the trajectories we need to understand uh, to see how we get from there? If you look at uh, this um, Earth trajectory, we are here at the center of the Earth policies. I think there are no policies uh, of Earth, for Earth, and by Earth, none. Uh, in fact, Earth doesn't need us, maybe just to get a little belt of plastic or uh, some uh, radionuclide warts up in there. Now she has both. We can be phased away, as uh, George Carlin said. It's another of these elements that you can see. But when you get to the uh, climatic cycles that uh, Earth was following for years, you see that the uh, interglaciary uh, cycles here for uh, 100,000 years were getting up up to the Holocene, when we moved, as I mentioned, to the uh, next level. And the question from the Anthropocene, so the last two centuries only, uh, is the question of getting back to some controlled, stabilized system uh, by only 1.5. This is the key goal for the uh, present um, 
report of uh, the IPCC or not getting it and then uh, getting throughout a uh, threshold that would make those very specific tipping point. And the tipping point making a hothouse environment that would no longer be uh, compatible with many uh, lives and many species. This stability is also seen for the last uh, two centuries uh, along what was affecting and the critical transition here is showing that it can be very brutal. Theoretically, there could be a very uh, quiet pathway, but usually you don't get that. Boom. You get down to the transformation of the system, and another equilibrium takes uh, place. And if you look at that uh, way of uh, thinking, Rockstrom, Johan, and, and Will Stephan uh, provided that for uh, uh, more than 10 years now. You see that we have major uh, systems that are now included in that equation. Climate, acidification of oceans, uh, uh, geobiochemical fluxes, especially nitrogen and phosphorus, uh, the freshwater uh, use, uh, the biodiversity, the aerosol, and the pollution, which is hard to quantify uh, as a global system, I mean. But uh, you see that uh, 10 years ago, we were already out for two of those uh, domains. And they provided, uh, a few years later, and the same way of understanding what were the pressure on uh, human species through the uh, nutrition, through the disease borne by vectors. Uh, malaria, for example, is one of those uh, diseases uh, through mosquitoes, but the dengue, uh, the chikungunya is now a very new one, uh, provided now on Europe uh, through the uh, progression up north by the uh, tiger mo mosquito. Uh, mental health, extreme weather, uh, resilience, air quality, food, eat, all those are uh, also getting an idea of what would be the places where we should focus and try to reduce the uh, external um, pressures. Because when you see it, what was published just uh, 40, now 50 years ago, almost, the limits to growth by uh, uh, Donna and Donnello uh, Meadows, the famous Meadows report. And when you look at what was followed in the next uh, 35 years, uh, you see in the uh, Australians, through uh, Turner and the Zero Group, did that. You see that all of those elements uh, and all those arrows for population, the demographic, alimentation, nutrition, production, pollution, resources, were following the green curve. What was the green curve in the projection of with very basic methodology, very uh, small computing capacities they had in that time? Um, the green curve was the business as usual curve. It means that they provided a way of thinking a few of the future elements in the early 70s, which were exactly what uh, we followed in the four next decades. Not changing at all, getting through energy, fossil energy, bringing CO2, heating up the system, and then providing a few of the difficulties that we are now um, looking at. A disturbing confrontation, said Turner. Disturbing. Because all the hypotheses were there. We knew what was going on. We even knew what could be the future. And in fact, Jim Ansett did the same for the climate. Uh, and uh, what was uh, put on the table in the 80s through the creation of the IPCC and then for the IPBS for the uh, biodiversity is also uh, showing that we had the knowledge for that. We couldn't get so far the action. But with the future, uh, it's intriguing because uh, we have had that back for millions of years, which is what the climate system went on. And you see that there are pockets, a red one, a blue one, an orange one. And in fact, 
the climate system uh, on Earth went from those for millions of years, stayed there for a while, then get, went to another one, then reduced a little bit, and this is very much related to what the CO2 content of atmosphere is. And now that we understand that, we see the very, very rapid changes that we are um, seeing here. And again, the question is how fast, how quick are those changes compatible with the adaptation of other systems uh, in the biosphere? Just a very small example of what would be a four Celsius degree increase in London is this. Just two floors of Westminster phased away. Mm. This is where the Lords, House of the Lords, are gathering. And this is where the heart of the democracy for a country outside of Europe now is. How many of you are heading back to London tonight? <laughs> None? <laughs> OK. No water this weekend. It's OK. We can still get up to understand a few other intricate risks. Um, McMichael was one of uh, those that put those elements together into the climate dysregulation consequences on direct impact through the extreme events, through the pollution, through the heat waves and canicules, uh, getting uh, higher rates uh, of mortality through its stroke, for example, but also uh, changes in the rates of uh, infectious diseases undernutrition, uh, whereas the physical alteration of the natural system would provide through the changes of uh, pH, through uh, water, the rivers, the uh, nitrogen and phosphorus cycle again, uh, biodiversity and, and climate change, uh, the ecological changes with impact on the yields, on the water quality, uh, on the presence of vectors. And the third one would be onto the social structures of uh, societies. Uh, with uh, high impact on the economic uh, conditions, the reduced production, uh, the precarity, migration, and the conflicts that uh, the next chapter of IPCC will uh, deal with. So those indirect impact might be even more important and even at closer terms than the direct ones. Just one, for example, is the uh, wheat in uh, 2021. You remember the uh, previous high price in 2008 were followed by hunger riots all over the world. Then we had canicules in Russia, in the US in the early uh, 2010s, and now we are back to that level right now. Another is how the oil prices went up before the uh, financial crisis in 2008 with a high volatility of uh, four, but now it's getting again back to the 70, 80, meaning that the volatility of those elements are a high component of how you provide a future perspective to uh, make your own market safe, because all the markets are depending on the energy prices. And the place of Europe here uh, may be a little bit risky place because we don't have fossil energy, we don't have fissile energy, no uranium, so we need to import all those. And we don't have anymore the space uh, to make large uh, renewable uh, areas just to shift, completely shift. It's possible, uh, but uh, we don't have the own space. So we need to have uh, places outside Europe to bring those elements at the same level of energy production that we have right now. So the uh, few health effects that we can see now through the climate, again uh, taken as an example, is something that you can see here with the direct impact on mortality and the number of deaths that you can uh, measure inside Paris and the region uh, with uh, at the different months with the uh, increase when uh, this is going above uh, 25 and 30 uh, Celsius degree. 
And this is all over the world, almost everywhere, the same uh, curve that you can find. So a slow increase with the um, low temperature uh, range, essentially because you can warm. You can have something on your body to prevent cold. That's what you have right now. Uh, you can heat your uh, own cave, your own apartment, uh, whereas you cannot do that. There is no way to get your skin out when it's uh, under a heat wave. You can be in cold places, you can stay in the shadows, but when it's 40 degrees outside and you are outside, there is no way to escape. Okay, you can take all the both out, then your adaptation process stops. And even for the uh, other side of the lifespan, meaning at birth, uh, the changes of uh, a prolonged duration of uh, increased temperature will change the birth weight of the babies. It means that the long impact of uh, canicule that might be uh, in the middle uh, 21st century or at the end of this century, will have probably devastating uh, consequences even at the very early development phase of our great grandchildren. And this is again very much understandable when you get to what is your capacity, for example, speed, and the relation with uh, temperature. The relation with temperature is with a center of an optimum range uh, between 20 and 25. And this is the exact same that you can get at all levels uh, of the uh, pyramid. And this one, for the performance as well as the survival rate, which is the inverse of the mortality rate, uh, is showing that you end up in the temperate region by always being back and forth from January with the lowest survival rate up to May, June, and then July, August are increasing the mortality rate and reducing the survival. And then you get back in September or November and you are always shifting from one side to the other with the season cycles. Question in 203, for example, in uh, France is showing that uh, alternance between the number of deaths every day which went up to uh, 100, uh, 1700, uh, 1800 uh, in 1997. And you see that there is a little peak in the uh, summer. Every summer in red, there is one little peak here, very small one, except in 2003, when that mortality rate was superior to the previous and the next winters. That's the only moment when we had that heat wave with such a huge impact onto the most vulnerable of us in France. The old people being socially uh, outside of the networks, being isolated in small places without uh, air conditioning, and all those were uh, providing most of the death uh, in that year. At the same moment, you also had impact and obviously the physiology is the same on uh, the livestock for uh, all the agriculture in uh, France, both cows and oxes, uh, mortality went up at the same moment. You had a reduced uh, yield that year for maize, for example. Uh, and this has brought the way of understanding how would be uh, the consequences of uh, each degree increase. For one degree, you have a reduction of 5% on maize, on soy, on rice, on wheat. All of these will be reduced depending on how hot the region would be. And this didn't, uh, uh, didn't miss that point that uh, in the last uh, autumn, uh, there were uh, Again, hunger, 
riots, not due to a reduced yield, like it was the case in 2008, but due to the distribution systems and due to the lockdowns that were decided from uh, several countries uh, without uh, providing the necessary replacement uh, for those systems. So uh, deaths were uh, occurred at those moments, but not only through the nutrition, but also through the rupture of prevention campaigns. Measles, for example, la rougeole in French, uh, polio, uh, where uh, the paralysis was uh, and remembered as being increased by a factor of four. So that's 400% increase just because there, were no, there was no uh, prevention campaign that were followed up during uh, this uh, 2020 year. And all the uh, diagnostic uh, testing, the screening tested for HIV, for uh, AIDS, for tuberculosis, malaria went down by 20%. The treatment for the multi-resistant tuberculosis was also reduced by a huge number, 30%. And this was uh, measured uh, as what were the consequences of uh, the major uh, infectious disease in uh, uh, sub-Saharan uh, Africa, looking at the major one, uh, malaria, which costing a huge amount of life, the red one on the left, because killing very young uh, infants and kids. Uh, the second one is the blue one uh, for AIDS, uh, for the uh, adults uh, between the 40 and 50s. Uh, the green one is the tuberculosis, and you see what the COVID is in orange. So the COVID death impact is only 3%, 3% of the, just four of those, not speaking of all the others, just those four, it's 3% uh, of all what uh, impact of these infectious diseases in these countries. So it means that what we were considering very early in uh, March 2020, showing that the curves were really very different in uh, high-income countries and in uh, African countries, has been confirmed month after month. This is a disease that we're heading to developed countries and much less to merging uh, countries and low and middle income countries. So the question is, it's unclear why we didn't take those elements to make our policies for that. We have a comprehensive economic evaluation that make the comparison of costs and benefits. That's the usual way we make that in terms of world public health policies. And we measure that by dailies, so uh, disability adjusted life years, so meaning how many of those years are lost or gained through your action. And again, this 3% is really showing that there was a problem with benefits that were increased in the mind of peoples, and especially in high income countries that were providing the uh, policies for all over the world, despite the fact that it began in China and that the first lockdown was put on Wuhan. But the question of how China is dealing with its own population, country, statistics, and how it provides the rest of the world with these numbers is another question. We had to do that. We should have done that. We didn't. And the question then is, why did we choose not to continue on the vaccination programs, polio, for example, uh, when we have decades of life expectancy, life duration that are provided through those campaigns, uh, whereas uh, we didn't make that cost efficiency uh, measure for the, what we call NPI, so the non-pharmacological interventions. So not the uh, treatments. Treatments, we only have one, for example, is vaccination for so far for COVID. Uh, that's the only one, or only treatment that works. It's a preventive one, but it works. Um, we don't have any treatment after the disease has come in, or very small and in very specific cases, not 
something that can be uh, provided for the rest. But we didn't make any assumption and any real evaluation of what those NPIs, such as lockdowns, such as masks in the exterior, were providing. You had only two studies for masks outside, not inside, but outside, that were done in Bangladesh and in Denmark. Bangladesh, it showed a very small reduction from 8.6 to 7.9 percent of infected people. Okay. And in Denmark, it didn't show any significant difference. So it means that when you are providing the real way and the methodology are existing for doing that, then you need to understand what are the uh, cause and consequences of your actions that will change a little bit the equilibrium in some countries. And in fact, this is what you are looking at the complete side. Uh, the uh, first arrow is the, uh, I would say, the second period after the Chinese uh, development of the infection. It was in March all over Europe and all over the world. The second is in November uh, 2020. So it is the winter period in the uh, uh, North um, Hemisphere. And then this is a delta, uh, and the last one is showing almost no increase in mortality, despite a high increase in the cases. Again, the question of what is our focus? Is that positive test? Is that deceased people that go to hospitals and need care? Is that dead people that provide the most accurate way of understanding what the impact of an epidemic is? And meanwhile, we don't take any action. There was no financial compensation system. And the head of the COP26 were deeply sorry at the end of the process by saying, didn't manage to, we almost went there. And then in the last hours, get the coal down. Not the coal, the coal. And the question is, why? It's a very simple for you, uh, economists. It's a question of, this time, linear relation between economy and energy. It is the same thing. You need energy. So the question is, where do you get the energy? First, where human and livestock forces, so slavery. Second was wood, and the British forest just disappeared in the 19th century, then that was coal, and it's still coal in many uh, countries of the world, then oil, yes, and very, very small part of renewable right now, plus nuclear. So what are the options now? Is understanding what we have to do for uh, looking at biodiversity changes, understanding the risk, for example, the changes of uh, adaptation and the areas for plants and animals. Remember that ecosystem that will change globally and they need to have the same entries and uh, outputs, meaning that species are adapted one to another. If, you, if one is getting 100 kilometers north and the second one is getting only 10 kilometers north, it doesn't work anymore. It doesn't work anymore. And you have geographical depth that are now uh, getting measured because uh, insects are getting quicker than birds and birds quicker than uh, small mammals. Uh, all these are changing everywhere. We have to understand how this will disrupt, again, those large chains inside the uh, biodiversity, which is uh, included. Water, water resource, resource sharing, for example, in uh, leisure water, but agriculture, which is not leisure at all, drinking water, or refreshing our nuclear plant when it's a heat wave. Well, in many uh, conditions, you are just stopping the uh, engine, the uh, nuclear um, plant. For agriculture and the nutrition is question about uh, resiliency of cities that cannot provide any system despite all the uh, uh, roof agriculture that you can make. You need uh, one hectare, uh, 10 acres, hectares. Uh, it's uh, 
roughly 100 by 100 meters. It's uh, in English, an hectare, how do you translate it? Hectare? Hectare, right, okay. So you need one, roughly, roughly. How you make that when you don't have any space in cities to provide, so you depend from networks from outside, okay? Uh, the question of resiliency of this supply system during crisis, and this was a question of what we called the uh, les premiers uh, de non pas de cordée cette fois-ci mais uh, les premières lignes uh, les premiers de corvée uh, were the ones that were providing inside uh, uh, food uh, um, places uh, how you would bring enough energy for uh, millions of people now it's more than 50 percent of uh, humanity which is living in urban uh, environment how do you get that and prolong that will be a question for uh, the next years the degradation of uh, working condition i mentioned in other environments the heat highlands that will even further increase the the risks uh, with the uh, elements all this is uh, questioning what are those interacting factors uh, and what uh, Sherrod Diamonds uh, showed, as many uh, others, uh, were that you had five principles of the demography, so the increase uh, by billions. Uh, demography is a question you have to put inside the equation. The climate, the water, the agriculture, the food production, and the energy are the one you are depending on for most of them. And we added a sixth one. What are the secondary effects of technology? N from engine, providing heat, providing a lot of help, but providing with fossil energy a huge amount of changes inside the uh, Earth's ecosystems. So what will be our uh, reaction under those settings, either we accept, we understand, and we accept that are two very different steps. We act when it's possible, still not done yet. Be creative or reinterpret, still in the respect and tolerance between each other, or denial, refusal, and then if you are not considering the uh, long-term hypothesis, the question of uh, conflicts will be posed. This is the one uh, we are being and putting uh, in the most uh, important way of changing our conception of health for the next um, chapter, as I mentioned. Changing the interpretation, being confident or defiant of what errors can be done in our understanding and the limits of our modelization systems also and getting a few ideas of uh, optimism through the way of uh, still walking on sliding slopes. Thank you. <laughs> we'll just mention a few of the people that uh, helped to bring uh, most of those uh, uh, elements in the, in the lab. Julian Antero, uh, Nicolas Forsman, Quentin de la Roche Lambert, Andy Marc, uh, Issa Moussa, Julien Chipman, Guillaume Solier, and Adrien Sudou, among many others. Uh, Gilles Boeuf also, with whom we uh, wrote uh, those books, L'homme peut-il s'adapter à lui-même, and uh, L'homme peut-il accepter ses limites. And as I mentioned, uh, the one, uh, the exhibition in uh, Le Musée de l'Homme uh, right now. Thank you. Um, if, Thank you. If I am right, uh, maybe not mentioning you, you are part of the IPCC, right? Yeah. A member of the IPCC. Yeah. Yeah, which is uh, 